just a little baby planet with Fei Mong of the University of Arizona. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we're going to look at little baby planets discussing the birth of solar systems. Later in the episode, we're going to be joined by University of Arizona astrophysicist Feng Long. She has recently developed a new means of finding young exoplanets as they form inside clouds of gas and dust. <coughs> but first, let's learn a little bit about how planets and solar systems are born around the cosmos. Now, planets coalesce from gas and dust revolving around their developing stars in formations known as protoplanetary disks. Finding young worlds in these dusky abodes is challenging at best. While planets hide within the shadowy sanctuaries, astronomers must rummage for indirect signs of planets in their infancies. Roughly 4.5 billion years ago, a massive cloud of gas and dust began to collapse inward, perhaps triggered by the gravitational influence of a passing star. This event would eventually give rise to our solar system. Now, gravity drew material together, coalescing into a ball of hydrogen and helium. Okay, along with traces of other materials. When enough hydrogen gas collects at the, near the center of a developing solar system, thermonuclear reactions ignite and a star is born. Further out from the burgeoning star, smaller clumps of matter fall together, forming planets, moons, asteroids, comets, the stuff of solar systems. Over time, remaining gas and dust is pushed away from the blossoming family of planets, and a solar system is born. Next up, we welcome Feng Long to the show. She is an astrophysicist at the University of Arizona who has recently found a new way to look for infant planets still swaddled in the murky clouds from which they were born. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Feng Long. She is an astrophysicist uh, at the University of Arizona, and she may have recently found a neat new way we can detect exoplanets around other stars. Welcome to the show, Feng. Thanks for having me here. Yes. Thank you. Um, so can you give, for those who may not be familiar, can you just give a give us a brief idea of how exoplanets are born, how they form, and, what, and a little bit about these disks that you look at? Yeah, so if you can imagine our solar system, there are like a sun in the center and there are many planets. They are mostly aligned in a disk. So if you can think back to trace back where they're born, they should form in that kind of disk plan. So that's our idea of how star planet forms. So once a star forms in the center, there is a lot of material moving around with it. And those materials will somehow collide to form those planets we see today in our solar system and also in our universe. So. What I study is about, okay, how those materials in disks, like those gas and different sides of dust particles, they climb and then build up different types of planets. And then I think the work we're going to discuss today is about, okay, how we can find new, newly born planets. They are still embedded in the disk environment. Hmm, hmm. So that's so interesting. And can you tell us a little bit about this system that that you uh, recently released a paper on? Yeah, so it's it's more like a sun-like star in the center, but it's at a 
from a very young age, it's just born system. The sun is a star there is also just born. So it still has a lot of material orbiting around the star. And in such a system, we somehow find there's many peculiar features there. You can imagine if there is a initial condition, everything should be kind of smooth out. But somehow we found out the system showing some um, white, bright rings and empty cavities. And it's inside the empty cavity we are finding the signature of planets. So you can imagine if you have a planet there, the planet can try to clean up its path. When it moves around towards its star, it, when, when it's expel material from its surroundings, in that case, you see an empty gap in the system. That's where the planet should be located. And then outside the planet orbit, there's a pile up of material. So you can see very bright emission rings there. So that's kind of one signature we claim there might be a planet. But there's another new evidence we found in our paper. Yeah, can you go into that a little bit? And yeah. I think that's really cool how you how you did this. Yeah, so because as I said that in previous studies, we already find many systems that you see those kind of empty region and also bright region. So people have imagined that, okay, there might be a planet there to doing that job. Um, but there are still many, many other hypotheses can make that feature happen. Many physics can do that, not involving any planets. Mm -hmm. But somehow we are finding a smoking gun evidence is that inside the empty region, we found there are there's left with some small amount of dust materials and they are configured in a special um, angle. So there are two patches of material. They are located in the azimuthal direction by 120 degrees and then their morphology looks very like what we see in models. If you put a planet into the disk, and then the planet will clean its orbit by moving material away from it. But when conditions allows, some small amount of material will also co-move with the planet. So they will form a horseshoe, horseshoe orbit with the planet. And when there is um, conditions that uh, material will be preferentially accumulated in two spots. Those called Lagrangian points, if you are familiar with those concepts. So if you have a star in the center and also a planet, there is five Lagrangian points around the star planet system. And the two we are, we are, we are talking about are Lagrangian four and five, which is in between, in, along the planet orbit, but in between the star and the planet. At the two locations, material will be preferentially located. So that's what we are seeing. We are seeing very bright emission at the two locations, which are separated by 120 degrees. Uh, in that case, we can predict where the planet should be, even though we do not see them, or do not see the planet directly. Hmm. And people might have recently encountered the Grandjean points uh, in the story of the James Webb Space Telescope. Yes, that's correct. Which also occupies one relative to Earth and the Sun. Yeah, that is at Lagrangian 2 right outside Earth's orbit. But we are talking about the four and five points, which is inside, like around Earth's or planet orbit, but inside that, that orbit location. Right, okay. It's wonderful. I just think that's so cool. So how can this phenomenon help us, you know, find other unknown planets, exoplanets around? Yeah, I think stars? we are still in a quite early stage because it's kind of the first case we find this feature because I, even though I say that they are bright, that you have preferential location of those material, but they are still quite faint. That's why people overlook those features in the past. So usually we, we only see empty area caused by the planet, but that tenuous feature in like launching four and five points are so faint, so it's really hard to find. So one way we should go deep enough. So when you look at, when you move your telescope to look at those young 
star-born systems, young, the young planet-born systems, you should integrate not enough, stare at them for at least a few hours. Then you might find out that feature. But meanwhile, as I said, that those features highly depend on how the disk property being look like. There are many um, properties in the disk can affect how the two parts can control the dust green and distribution there. So I think one way we should just search for more systems like this, especially those have already have empty regions and still at those spots for a longer time. And meanwhile, I think from the theoretical part, we have to really understand what's going on there because even those features have been predicted in the past, we have still features in simulations where you put a planet into the disk, but still their nature are quite elusive because we don't have many observational evidence how they might look like because particles there, they might have different properties like how they collide with each other. And also when they, so when particles collide, they can either stick together to grow to larger sizes or they will break up apart. So there are many physics we still don't understand the, at, at that part. Yeah, but I think apparently more observations towards those young systems will be beneficial to us. I should also mention that the feature depends on the property of the planet. So you can imagine if you have a more massive planet, it will create a much wider gap, a wide empty reach in the system. A more massive planet has more potential. They will also destroy the this harsh rain. So which is bad because if it if it's too massive, you won't see that rain anymore because it's just try to destroy that. So we are kind of at the sweet point that we are find using this feature to find those low mass planets like Neptune to Saturn mass planet. Yeah, Jupiter may not be able to identify from those kind of feature, which is sad. <laughs> oh. Um and so are there lessons to be learned from this about the formation of our own solar system? Um, yeah, I think so. We are kind of finding a Neptune as planet and the location. We have a Neptune. Of... <laughs> yes, we have Neptune. <laughs> Almost but two our... of them. <laughs> <laughs> but our Neptune is much clo it's a bit closer than what we found here in this particular system. So I think one needs to recognize that if this is real a planet signature, which means that planet formation has has been really quick because the system is so young, it's only like one million year. Okay, right, it's right. not that young in terms of our human life, but one million year in astronomical context is really young. Right. So at that early stage, you have already formed a planet, which is quite amazing. And we still don't know how we can, how we are being able to form those systems because it, so when those, when those system forms, all the dust particles are very tiny. So in the interstellar medium, the particles are mostly micron size particle. You can imagine to, we have to grow particles from micron size to Neptune size. That is like more than 10 orders of magnitude in size difference, which is huge. Mm -hmm. And then you have to grow that huge amount of size in such a short time scale, which is a real theoretical challenge. So we don't know yet how that happened and nature did that. I think there's some, maybe the some clues that the series will work out how we can make such a big planet in such a short time scale. I think that's the most important uh, lesson we have to learn from there. Mm. And also, and I think another important part is that it tells that we maybe have already understand the basic fundamentals of how planet interacts with its environment because we are seeing the features exactly predicted in our models back many years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you used um, the ALMA uh, network of radio telescopes to, to study this. And one of the reasons, as I understand, is because the signal of this is so weak, of these little, little clumps, 
Um, so what other instruments are there now that can under that can see this sort of phenomenon and, and yeah, Arma is still the best because the things that the material here in the disc are so cold. They are really cold, so they emit at a frequency which is ARMA is the best to, to detect. Right, yeah. yeah. So and then ARMA is also the most sensitive one to find out those emissions from those dust particles. Um, people have tried to using that like James Webb. Webb can do a lot, but Webb still only sensitive to um more massive planets because web is going to detect either the uh, direct emission from the planet or scatter light somehow in the disk and we are looking at the disk material not the planet itself um so arma can also try to find material around the planet which is called as a circumplanetary disk so it's the same concept you have a star you have a disk the disk is called a circumstellar disk and the planets will form in this disk but once you form a planet in the disk material can also orbit around the planet forming a circumplanetary disk this is also how our satellites moons form in our solar system and you can also find the tiny signals from the disk around the planets this is also one way to find young planets, but still we don't know if such small planets like Neptune do have its disk already formed at that early stage or not. Yeah. Hmm. And so finally, what's what's next for you? What's what's your next? What are you looking at next? Yeah, I, I would definitely um eager to look into the data um, archive data set to find more features like this. Actually, this is, the data I used for this project is not data I propose for ARMA to take a look at. Just I look into the archive. People have proposed to observe this target, and then I collect information there. So it's like make use of what already existing in the, in the, in the literature. So I think there are still many chance we can do similar things to other systems. Like, like I said, we don't know, we still don't know how those features can sustain and finding more will be very helpful for, for, for us to understand how the physics really works and understand in what conditions those features can be there and to infer the planets. And um, another side of my work is really trying to understand how different types of um, disks form different types of planets. So now we have found thousands of exoplanets, but their system properties are so different. So it makes our solar system quite special, but I guess that's just because we haven't touched um, like, like our Earth yet. But still those exoplanet detection telling us that every system is quite different. And that difference must have some origin. And I think it's most likely due to how they form. So I'm looking at different types of disks and trying to understand how they lead to different types of planetary systems. That's most of my work is focusing on. Wow, that is so interesting. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Fang. It was great talking with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Welcome back. And that was uh, that was Fang Long, astrophysicist at the University of Arizona. Among the youngest exoplanets known include K233 b, believed to be between five and ten million years old. Now, to put this in perspective. If the Earth, which is roughly four and a half billion years old, were thought of as a 45-year-old person, the exoplanet K233b would be the equivalent of an infant just a few months old.
Another young world, this one a gas giant, appears to be forming around the star AS209, which is around 720 light years from Earth. Now, this exoplanet was found by studying gaps and rings around the central star. The hidden world in a Leica 15 protoplanetary disk uncovered by Fang Long was the first exoplanet ever discovered by recognizing concentrations of gas and dust as gravitational Lagrangian points bookending unseen worlds. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion for our special Halloween special. That's how special it is. We're going to be talking about Death in Space! Be joined by Kevin Keith, founder of Space Crystals. He's figured out a way to send your DNA to the moon, beating death forever. Lunar Zombies! If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe, follow, and share the show at your leisure. Hey, has anyone ever built a radio telescope to see if aliens might enjoy this show? I, I, I think they might. They might. You know? You never know. Sign up for our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. It got free and VIP plans available, so enjoy and clear sky.